understand how to break down and dissect it as you go through it. And we're going to read pretty much the entire chapter of John 11 today where Lazarus uh, is uh, resurrected. And there's so many things in uh, this chapter that we're going to look at from an inspirational standpoint. There's probably 20 different sermons alone you can take out of this chapter and go just from, like I said, just from a practical inspirational standpoint. Now, historical, when John writes, and I, I always love the way John writes, he writes very accurately. He puts the characters like a, like a novel. He puts the characters there, and he, and he writes it uh, from a historical standpoint of an eyewitness account. If, if he wasn't even there, he gets eyewitness testimony, and he writes it, writes it in the Bible. Uh, and he puts in you know, numbers, uh, attendees, characters, and all of that stuff is just to make the story just more and more believable. I always say uh, whenever one of the kids wants to, they kind of ask me what book they should read. I, I always tell the kids to start in John and then go to First John, Second John. He's like the easiest book for for me to understand and read because John makes things relatable. And when I preach, I try to make things relatable from my own standpoint or just stuff that I know is happening out there. I don't, I don't, I don't try to get too high and mighty and preach theoretical stuff I don't have a grasp on. I just kind of make it relatable. And that's what John does so well in this uh, account of Lazarus here. Now, doctrinally, this is God restoring the nation of Israel. Lazarus is a Jew. He's dead. The nation of Israel is dead for 400 years. Jesus Christ is the one who came back down. He tried to restore the nation of Israel. They ultimately killed him, rejected him, wanted nothing to do with him. You could also look at uh, resurrection in the uh, uh, after the tribulation period as well. So doctrinally, it's pretty easy. God restoring the nation of Israel. Now, inspirationally, there are so many things in this chapter. We're going to go through and pretty much just hit, uh, we'll skip around, but we'll hit um, what I think are the important ones. All right, so let me uh, see here. Yeah, let me read and we'll uh, break some of these things down. Uh, now, a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary which was anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, The sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, and the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And when he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Now what pops out at you from an inspirational standpoint right off the bat? Yeah, that's one. What else? That too. There's also one that sticks out to me in verse 6 there. He knew that the man who he loved, one of his friends, he loved his family. Whenever he came into Bethany, this is where he stayed. These were followers. These were disciples. These were people who loved Christ. And look what happens. His best friend is sick. He stayed where he was for two days. He didn't come a-running, did he? Now, why is that? I've heard this message preached a few times where you get yourself into sin, God's not so, not so quick to get you out of sin. Right? I've heard that. Who's heard that one? You've heard that message. You can go that way with it. It's fine. I read that when I say that because of verse 5 when you break that, or verse yeah, 4 when you break that down. It is not unto death, but unto the glory of God. See, Jesus knew Lazarus wasn't going to die as the world sees it. Jesus knew Lazarus was going to just go to sleep. He knew where he was. He knew what was going to happen to him. That's why he didn't freak out. What happens to most of us when we get that phone call that, you know, mom fell down and she's in the hospital? What do all of us do? We drop what we're doing. We get in the vehicle and we go 100 miles an hour to the hospital. Like, what am I going to do? I'm a carpet layer. Am I going to do surgery? Am I going to mend her broken bone? There's nothing I can do, but I am a Christian. You know what I should do? What would help at the most part? If you guys all know, say it. Pray right away, right? But we don't do that in this worldly standpoint. Even as Christians, what do we do? We freak out. We freak out. And it's understandable. It's human nature. We all freak out. I've been through a lot of tragedy in my life, and it just every single time I freak out and I realize what I'm here for, you know. But it's just natural. But look how Jesus handles this thing. He, he said he heard he was sick, and he abode two days still. This is a guy that he loved. Best friends. Now we'll break this down. Um, I'll do it here. Uh, 
And I, I think it's uh, important to note, too, whenever you're breaking down the Bible, to get the cast of characters. I do this back with the kids all the time. Get the cast and set it out. Now, I might spell this wrong. I'm a terrible speller here. Uh, Lazarus. Kids make fun of me all the time. Okay. So anytime you see sickness in the Bible, uh, whether it be, what's that stuff that grows on your arm? What's that stuff called? Leprosy. Yeah, leprosy, blindness, uh, deafness. Anytime you see God dealing with that, it's always usually a picture of sin. And the Jews believe, especially from back in uh, Exodus and Moses, they set up whenever somebody had those things, had leprosy or something, it's because they had sin unconfessed or un, uncleansed at the temple, right? That's how we identify sickness in the Bible. We always kind of pair it to unconfessed sin or something like that. That's the way the Bible kind of, you see it whenever you're breaking down the Bible and you're understanding how to you know, work through what's being talked about. But God chooses Lazarus in this moment, and we know that Lazarus is a friend of Christ. He's a disciple. He's a follower. Uh, he loved him. So Lazarus is not only a Jew, but he was a good man. Okay? He wasn't an unsaved, unwashed sinner. It's like the, what, what would happen if you have a sickness in another way. So it's, it's important to know that they use Lazarus here in this story for a reason. It wasn't just because he was sick. He was just a guy who was sick, like one of us who gets sick. Right? Martha, we know her. Uh, she's a busybody. And Mary, I think we had her down. She has the she has this deep spiritual, yeah, deep spiritual relationship. This is one I might mess up. Spear. Deep spiritual relationship with God. So we have the cast of characters, and obviously we have uh, Jesus in there, who is the physician. He's the doctor that comes on scene, right? Now. Like I said before, John is very specific in how he writes things, how he sets stuff up for a reason. Uh, and he's always documenting on how Christ kind of goes about what he does. He does it for himself on his own time, right? When when uh, when Jesus' first miracle was turning the water to wine at a wedding at Cana, nobody was allowed to see that. He kicked them all out, and he did it on his own. You know, the disciples were kind of upset about that. They wanted people to see what he'd done. John the Baptist downright got angry. He wanted Jesus to profess that he was God and do crazy cool. He wanted him, you know, pull the moon down and set it right here. Do something and pur uh, purposefully, you know, let him know you're God right now. He was getting kind of upset about it. Uh, when Jesus went through Samaria, you know, to, you know, he met the woman at the well. All the disciples said, you got to go around. We can't go through Samaria. And we find out that it ain't because they don't want to go through Samaria that the the Jews hated Samaritans. They thought they were less than dogs. So much so that James and John wanted to, Jesus to call fire from heaven and kill the Samaritans. And, John, and Jesus kind of shut that down real quick. Uh, flip over to John 7, 6. <coughs> John 7, 6. And this one is so true. Um, if you just pull this verse out, and I know what it's talking about, but if you pull this verse out just by itself, inspirationally speaking, and that's what we're doing tonight. It says, Jesus saith unto him, my time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. And isn't that just so true how we kind of treat Jesus? We are always ready for an answer. We're always ready for a prayer. We're always hungry for more. But Jesus kind of works on a wholly different uh, time clock, and we just can't handle it. I'm probably one of the worst ones in here. I'm glad I stay busy in this church because I am extremely impatient with everything. I'm a very impatient person. Ask my family to go to a restaurant. I, they better have their order by the time that waiter comes up. If they don't, I'm like, what are you getting? What are you getting? What are you getting? I don't want to wait again. You know what they do? They go back in the back on their cell phone, and they fart around. You know, they make your hand of water, and then 20 minutes later, they'll get you a drink. So you're like, oh, oh, it's good. I hate going on dinners with more than, like, eight people. I can do it, but I just, I'm no good at it. After about 20 minutes, I start kind of freaking out a little bit because I'm a fast eater, too, because I'm impatient with that, as you can tell. So... I'm very, very super impatient. But Jesus says, you guys are always ready. His disciples were always ready. My time has not yet come. You were always ready. You want me to do these things that are not what I'm needing to do right now at this moment. So keep that in mind as well. See, these are all inspirational things. You can go on and on with that one verse. That could be a 40-minute sermon easily. All right. <clears throat> 
What's up, dude? Oh, yeah. Good one. They're all good ones. So, uh, verse 7, we'll pick up. John 11, bud. John 11, 7, it says this. So remember, Jesus, Jesus didn't freak out. He stayed there. He just stayed there for a couple days while his friend was dying. Then after he said to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. His disciples saying, and master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? You see, even though the Jews, uh, even though the disciples, sorry, even though the disciples loved uh, Lazarus, they, they were kind of thinking about themselves. They didn't want to deal with their friend at this moment because they were worried about the Jews stoning them and killing them. And Jesus answered, he gets a little sarcastic here with them. Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in a day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbles not because he seeth the light of the world. If any man uh, walk in the night, he stumbles because there is no light in him. So those two verses right there are packed with a lot of stuff. But Jesus gets sarcastic with them. He's saying, Aren't there twelve hours a day? Of course they know there's twelve hours a day. They're grown men. You know, they're young guys. They understand there's twelve hours in a day. He's kind of letting them know, like, We got plenty of time, boys. We got plenty of time. Why? Because Jesus knows what Lazarus is. He knows where he's going to go. He's not freaking out. Verse 11. <clears throat> These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of the sleep. So you see, it says our friend. He's not, just, he's not just a person to these guys. He's our friend. They all love Lazarus. Like I said, anytime they come into this town, Bethany, this is where they stay. Mary and, Ma uh, Mary and Martha have hosted them before for dinners and stuff like that. And uh, this, this is the family they all knew. And he says, Lazarus, Lazarus sleepeth, that I may go wake him out of sleep. And his disciples say, Lord, if he sleep, um, they shall do, he shall be do well. They just don't, they don't understand what he's saying. They can't get it. Howbeit Jesus spoke of the death, but they thought that he had spoken of uh, taking uh, rest and sleep. Then, this is a funny one, actually. I think this is funny. Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Like, listen, idiots. You guys, he, he dead, he dead. I'm trying to do some high-end stuff here, kind of this, I'm, high, I'm, I'm th playing 3D chess, and you guys are just too stupid. I'm third leads is like, golly, these guys. I should have went and got some lawyers or some bankers or something. I got a bunch of dumb fishermen and construction workers, and they just can't get it. He's dead, that's what he's saying. Like, he's just freaking out a little bit. Like, come on, knuckleheads. Anybody had those guys that worked before? Like, yeah, okay. All right, I have to come down and show you how to do this. Uh, look at the verse 11 though. It's not only that um, this is our friend. He makes it personal. See, he takes this guy Lazarus and he's making it personal to them and making it personal to him. Our friend. And he said, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. See, Jesus is the only cure. He knows it. For a Christian, death has no sting. Why? Because Jesus is the cure already. He already paid the price. We don't have a sting. Yeah, sure, we're all going to uh, die someday, but there is no sting. Go to Ecclesiastes 9. I didn't have this written down, but I was looking at it. If you guys have anything to say, go ahead. The kids talk a lot. You guys are so quiet. It always bothers me when I do you, uh, Thursday nights. Kids are loud. They ask questions. They throw stuff. Caleb usually falls over the chair. I'm not kidding. Just falls out. <coughs> Ecclesiastes 9, and I was reading this actually uh, um, a couple days ago. I was, like I said, I had to do a funeral. And I was kind of looking through stuff. I didn't use this because it's kind of morbid. But um, Verse 2, 9 2. All things come alike to all. There is one event to the righteous and one to the wicked, one to the good and one to the clean, and all and to the unclean. To him that sacrifice, to him that not sacrifices not, and is uh, and is to the good, to the sinner, and he that sweareth as he is feareth an oath. There is all, all things come alike to all. There is one event to all. What's that event? Everybody's going to experience. Yeah, everybody in this world has one thing in common. That's what this thing's talking about. There is an evil among the things, uh, evil among things that are done of the sun. There is one event unto all, yea, to the heart of the sons of men is full of evil, and madness is in their heart while they live, and after that they go to the dead. He's talking about death again. He's saying we all are, we all are, nobody's getting out of this. Verse 4, but look here. For him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. Now, if you guys know anything about 
Jews, especially during the time the Bible was written, I think even today, Jews do not think much of dogs like we do. Americans love dogs. We let dogs lick us in the face. They sleep in our bed. They're disgusting. I mean, my, I have a bulldog. It's, I slip in her slobber every single day. It's just, why is she living with this is the question. And then it's, it's, she's just nasty. They're just gross. Jews wouldn't have this in their house. They don't do it. Romans had dogs. Egyptians carried cats, right? They had cats in their house. Romans had the dogs. Germans had dogs. Jews didn't have dogs, and they thought of dogs as just nasty, vile, unusable creatures. They ate their vomit, right? They ate their poop. They're disgusting dogs. And now look what a Jew is saying here. He's saying, all the living is hope, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. And what's a lion always represent, right? The king of the jungle, king, cats, majestic, right? He's saying, I would rather be, I would rather be a lowly carpet layer than the king of England, right? I would rather be alive as a lowly carpenter with no money in his bank account than the king of England with all the riches and gold he could ever establish, right? Why? Because there's hope. What's the hope of? That you could actually be a righteous person and get to heaven. If you're dead and you don't ever have that righteousness, there's nothing you can do. You're better off being a living dog, right? Lowest of the low. For the living know that they, uh, for the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. <laughs> it's a funny one. The dead know not anything. Neither have they uh, more reward, the more mer- uh, for the memory of them is forgotten. The memory of them is forgotten. You ever wonder why all these rich multi-millionaires and billionaires put their names on buildings? Why do they spend all that time and money making sure their name is all everywhere to be displayed and plastered? Why? Because their memory will be forgotten at some point, point. and we know this. Rich men have had. Uh, statues put up, and guess what happened during COVID? How many statues got them torn down, right? There ain't no statue going to survive another 100 years. There'll be something else put up. You know, we'll have you know, Kamala Harris statues everywhere. But nobody's going to, the memory of them, their memory is forgotten, and that's so true. You know, you give two, two or three generations away, I have no idea who my great-great-grandparents, I don't even know my great-grandpa. I don't know, know who he was. Didn't look his name. Never cared to. So many people do. They like that stuff. Do you know that stuff? I never got into it. It doesn't really matter. He wouldn't know me. I wouldn't know him. You know, it's just the way it is. The memory of this, I've forgotten. This is, this is so sad for somebody who just dies suddenly. And trust me, I just did a funeral for my uncle who was more than likely a lost guy burning in hell right now. And he had eight people at his funeral. You know, brothers and sisters, then me and my other brother went. And I just went because they asked me to preach. I actually wouldn't plan on going. My aunt, my aunt called me because I'm the Christian of the family. She calls me if I do the service. I'm like, what? What's the point? But I did it. And I did a little five, six-minute thing for him. I made it kind of lighthearted and funny because, I mean, how do you preach a hard message to people who just lost somebody and you know he's probably burning in hell? I ain't going to blast them. Not, not the time for that, right? It ain't just ain't the time for it. Not a good place to do it. So I, I mean, I, I I tried. I spun around to the gospel and stuff, and we we had an okay time, time, and they liked what they heard, and it was it was fine. But it was it was weird preaching a funeral, my first funeral too, to a person who I probably know is burning in hell right now. It's it sucks really to think about it. And source 6 says this, anyway, look what happens to these people. All their love and their hatred, their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more portion forever in the thing that is done unto the son. And then it goes on down. It tells you to love your wife and have a good life and raise kids and do all that fun stuff. But we all have that one event that's going to happen, everybody. And uh, I'm talking about death and all this stuff. It's kind of, a, kind of a funny but morbid little Thursday night, isn't it? It's going to just all death here. Don't worry, we'll get to some fun stuff here. All right, uh, where are we at? 14, uh, 15. Now Jesus says again, he said, I am glad for your sakes I was not there to the intent you may believe. Nevertheless, let's go into him. Now look at this tough guy here. That's what I have now. Now you could read this verse. I've heard several messages on this verse right here, verse 16, that go different ways. This is, this is what it means to break down your Bible inspirationally. You can go different ways, and it's really not a big deal. When you start preaching doctrine, you better be on point, or you know I got to get up and walk out. But inspirationally speaking, you can preach this message or this verse three or four different ways. This is how I read it. 
Then Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, said, Let us also go, that may we may die with him. Now, I read, I read a guy the other day, a commentary, and he said, Look how courageous Thomas is. He's willing to die alongside his buddy. I was like, good grief. I don't read it like that. I just don't. First of all, we know who Thomas is. Thomas is the doubting guy who says, point blank, he has to touch Jesus in his holes in his hands if he's going to believe, by God, this guy came back to life, even though he told you multiple times this is what he was going to do. But Thomas gets all high and mighty and pious, right? Let us go with him that we may die with him. Have you ever been in a hospital situation and you got that one person in your family you just wish would shut up? Just shut your mouth. You're not helping the situation. Anybody? We've all been there, right? Especially when you become the Christian. So I didn't become a Christian until I was 33. So when I go in a situation now, they all kind of look to me to be like the leader now. It really is weird. It's kind of it's weird how the family kind of does all that stuff. But um, but you always get that guy, that one who know he knows more than the doctor does. By God, it must be this. I guarantee it ain't that. I'm like, oh, shut up. This is Thomas right here. This is Thomas. He's he's taking the death of Lazarus and putting it, oh, let's go. I will die with my friend. Like, come on, dude. Come on, Thomas. We know who you are. We know you. You know, my, okay, that's another death story. My grandpa died suddenly of a heart attack in front of us. We were all having like a Sunday dinner. He literally just head down. I was the one who had to pick him up by the chair and we tried to do CPR on him, but uh, his heart just blew up. My brother I mean, my grandma was in the room, my mom was in the room, my wife was in the room. Cole was three months old at the time, so this was right at 18 years ago. And, uh, uh, you know, we're doing it. I mean, I know he, I know it's bad. I know like, we're trying to do CPR on him, but, you know, it's pretty obvious he died right, right there. So we go outside, and the ambulance comes up, and they get the gurney and stuff. And here comes my brother, who's still lost to this day. I mean, this dude, he is total atheist. Like, yeah, he's not even agnostic. I mean, he hates all any of his stuff. I'm working on it. He's getting there. But uh, he comes bebopping up, and he does a line from City Slickers. That movie City Slickers? When we seen that? When, when the main guy, Curly, dies, one of the guys comes up and goes, man, the guy ate bacon for 40 years. You, you can't do that. Like, it was a joke. My brother comes up. In the midst of all this crying and wailing and gnashing of teeth, right? Man, he ate bacon for 40 years. Just can't do that. I look at him like this. I was like, your grandfather just died. He goes, oh, you know, sank. Realize how a jerk he was. That, you don't make certain moments about you at this time. There's no time to crack a joke. Good grief, the family is, the patriarch literally is dying. Once once my papa died, family broke up. He's, that, that was it. You ever been in the families where just don't get back together after the main person dies? That was him. Once he died, that was it. I've never really saw my aunts and uncles after that. Maybe a couple times every once in a while. Wasn't the same. Our family was done after he died. So, and it sucks for me that I have to remember that. That's what I remember. My brother being a jerk at that moment. We don't need Thomases out there. But, see the inspirational side, you could preach it both ways. You know, look how great Thomas was. He was I, I don't know about y'all, I don't read it like that. But, you can if you want. There's really no dogmatic uh, uh, aspect to it. Alright. <clears throat> then when Jesus came, he found he had lain in the grave four days already. So he finally got there. He did, this dude done died and been dead for four days, buried in the grave. So he, yeah, Jesus really took his time. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs, and many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary sat still in the house. Now look at these two girls. We know them from the other story, right? We know that Mary, Martha was the busybody when Jesus came in. She cooked. She cleaned. She was mad at Mary for not helping her and stuff, and Jesus had to kind of yell at her a little bit like, listen, she's, Mary's doing what she needs to do. She's worshiping me. We don't know what you're doing, Martha. You're doing what you have to do. But you guys are two different people. People don't worship the same way. And people don't mourn the same way. Look what happens here. Look at these two women. Mary stayed at the house. When she knew Jesus came, what did Martha do? She could hear Jesus came. You know, busy body Martha, she got him ran downhill. She got down there in a hurry. Now, verse 21 is probably one of the most human. Uh, I, when, I, when I break this down, this is the, one of the most human sounding verses in the Bible. And if you, you want to really know your Bible, 
I said this to the kids anyway, you guys know, you're adults, but if you want to know your Bible and you want to break down your Bible, find verses like this one and make it relatable in your life. Look how human uh, Martha is in this moment. This is, and Mar Mary has the same one here in a little bit. But Martha, in, the, in one of the most human verses in the Bible, Mar Martha said unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been there, my brother had not died. I'm sure as Christians, we've all been in this situation, right? You pray for somebody, you pray for help, you pray for a loved one, and the demise happens, and you're like, man, you kind of put it on Jesus. That's what Martha does here. I mean, I've seen this preached two different ways. I've seen it preached where Martha puts it all on Jesus, just hangs it out to him to hang him out to dry. And uh, I don't see it like that because she doesn't hate Jesus. She doesn't... Uh, leave the faith and turn around and, you know, go away and call herself a Muslim and change to religion. She doesn't do all that. She still calls him master. She still calls him Lord. Even in the verse, she calls him Lord. If you're that mad at God and you want to turn away from him, you wouldn't do all these things. And how this verse is relatable, when my brother, who was 22 at the time, got diagnosed with cancer and he died six months later, he had, they gave him six months to live. I just watched that kid, any bigger than me, stronger than me, healthy just watch him wither away down to nothing. He's screaming uh, every once in a while in the hospital, just kill me now, kill me now, kill me now. And seeing a big, strong guy like that just do that just breaks you down. And I literally at that time, I, I was still kind of new. I, you know, I hadn't been saved all that long, but still, here comes the family. I have questions, all these things. I'm like, good grief. I don't know even how to handle this myself. You know, I found myself, I mean, confess people's one false to another. I don't know if it's a fault. You know, I find myself at the time just angry as I could be at God, at Jesus, for letting this kid do this. I mean, either way, I was like, take him or, or heal him, Lord, but do something. You know, this is horrible. That's just the way I felt at that moment. While I was on my way to church, while I was on my way to Bible study, just giving it to Jesus. You know, why? I was upset. You know? Martha's the same way. If you had been there, he had not died. Because they only know Jesus doing miracles, touching and being there, right? They still don't know what he can do when he's not away. So you've got to put, her, put yourself in Martha's shoes at that moment. I don't think she's blaming Jesus. I think she's just thinking if he was there, he would have been okay. Right? But she runs to Jesus, and, and uh, she has these things to say to him. But I know even now, this is Martha again, but I know even now whatsoever thou will ask of God, God will give it to thee. This don't seem like somebody who's that all that upset and blaming Jesus. She's mad, but she ain't blaming him. Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He believeth in me. Though he were dead, he shall yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had said these things, he went, or she went her way, and he called Mary, the sister, secretly, saying, the master has come and calleth for thee. And as soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came into town. Now, <laughs> Mary was mourning in a different way than Martha, right? She knew Jesus was in town. She knew he was there. I mean, good grief. Jesus Christ came into town. He's a rock star. He, of course, Mary knew he was there. But she stayed. She didn't run out to see him. Why? She's, Mary is heartbroken here. And you can see it here. Jesus had not yet come into town, but he was in that place. Martha met him, Jews which were there at her house and comforted her. When they saw Mary, she rose up hastily and went and followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him and fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hast been there or here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, right? She's mourning differently than Martha was. Mar they didn't say Martha was weeping. Martha was confronting Jesus and telling him, if you had been here, all these things would be good. Mary's heartbroken. And she's not mad at Jesus. She's just heartbroken, and she's weeping. And look what happens here. And he groaned in the spirit and was troubled and said, Where have ye laid him? And they say, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. This is my son's favorite memory verse, by the way. Two words. He loves it. What's your favorite verse, Cole? Jesus wept. Oh, he's got a long one. I can't remember it. <laughs> but see how uh, see how we got different people in different places. I mean, I know again we've all been in these situations where you got you got the guy in the hospital, the mom running around, 
changing the bed, changing the sheets, and doing all these things, and doing the wiping and the cleaning, and just keeping herself busy, Martha. But then you got the one who's just sitting there by the bedside, sad, praying, upset. This is what you got here. This is so relatable to us today. That's why they picked this whole thing, made this chapter so long, and picked Lazarus in the first place. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused this man, even this man should have not died? So there's people in the crowd who witnessed a miracle and still questioning this guy's abilities. I mean, nuts. This guy can't get away from it. Jesus, therefore, again groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave, a cave, and a stone lay upon it. It's a picture of his own death, burial, resurrection here. And Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was uh, dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh. <laughs> Talk about a re reality check to put in the Bible, right? That's why John adds these things. He's been dead four days, Lord, he stinks. You sure you want to take the stone away? Let's leave him. I don't even want to mess with this smell. Yeah, I know you can resurrect him and all, but good night. I mean, see, Martha still has a little doubt. Jesus just told her he's going to resurrect. And he's like, well, take the stone away so I can get this done. Well, uh, yeah, calm down, Jesus. He stinks really bad. Martha, what I just say? Oh, take the stone away. i got to show you something cool here. I mean, he just can't get away from these guys, right? Jesus said on her, he kind of flashed her a little bit. Jesus said, I said, not unto thee, if thou would believe us, thou should see the glory of God. Do you believe me? Do you want to see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where it was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee, uh, for thou hast heard me. And I know, and I know that thou heardst me always, but because of the people which I stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And we had thus thou spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. That's probably where you guys heard me yelling last time. I kind of acted this out again. And this is a, I mean, everybody's probably heard this one preached, where Lazarus comes out of the, of the grave. And he came out forth, hand, foot, bound in grave clothes, and his face was bound with a napkin. And Jesus said unto them, loose him and let him go. Now there was three resurrections in the Bible. The first one was a little girl. She was 12 years old. She'd been dead hour or so and Christ came in there and she said oh she's asleep get up and run away a little 12 year old girl she sprang right up and ran off right the next guy was I don't know probably in his 20s or early 30s something like that he died he'd been dead a day or so they were carrying him uh, out to bury him and Jesus came by and touched him this guy sat up and he, they said he sat on the side of the road and uh, just kind of took his time you know but he was okay but he was alive and it was a miracle that happened Lazarus, Jesus says, get up and walk. He comes out, but he's, he needs help. He's covered in these grave clothes, the wrappings, and the inspirational message is there. The longer you wait to get right with Jesus, the longer you get wrapped yourself around in this world, and it's hard to get off, and you have to have help. And we see that. You know, I got saved when I was 32 years old. I mean, it took a while. It took a while for me to get out of the stuff I was into. Right? It just kind of, the habits I had formed, the friendships I had, all those guys are gone. At least they're gone in the sense of what we used to hang out with. Now we hang out, it's totally different, you know, totally different. They don't bother me, I don't bother them. We can still be buddies. But, um, uh, you know, all the, all, the, all the things and the habits I used to get into, it took me a while. Now, if I was a young kid, like my youth group kid, I tell them kids all the time, I go, man, you guys are so lucky. You got saved when you're a young kid? I mean, good grief. You get, you get in a good church with... Good parents who love you and want to see you grow up in a in a certain way in a Christian household and you know you're the apple of their eye and stuff like that. Um, they're 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 lucky and I I am lucky too. I'm lucky I didn't die in a ditch somewhere in the age of 20 and I'd be burning in hell with my uncle right now. You know I, just, I lucked out, but they also I mean they hit the jackpot with with you parents in this church just uh just seeing seeing to their salvation and seeing to their growth. Verse 45, And the many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen these things which Jesus did believed on him. And look what happens all the way down. You get the same old scribes and the Pharisees who just witnessed a guy who's been dead. I mean, he probably stinks really bad still. I mean, he's going to take, what, 10 baths? How many times you dip in a Jordan River to clean that off? I don't even know. But, um... I mean, this, it's amazing that Jesus still had to do these things. And in verse 12, that's when he kind of stops talking to these people over, over and over, but, or chapter 12 anyway. But 
What time we got? We seven forty. Oh, what time do we end? Seven thirty. That was okay. All right, well, we're good. So my question for tonight would be: after reading all that and understanding um, some things that you know, we were breaking these things down. What is a Christian? And I want this to be open to anybody. Like, what is a Christian? What is our role as a Christian to the world? I mean this. It's great that we're in a church that takes deep dives. We we go deep into doctrine, right? I mean, there's people in this church probably know the color of the Antichrist's eyes, count the number of hairs on his head, right? What good does that do people? You know what I mean? What good does that do anybody? I mean, it helps some people. I get that. Especially a young Christian who's growing in the Bible. You know, he comes up, asks Kyle a question, and he can take him right to that something that's kind of like, okay. And it and it makes you want to dig deeper, right? All these things make... Uh, Kyle's got his habits. I've got my habits of how I stay in the Bible. Kyle likes numerology. I'm not quite so much a numerology guy. I like numbers. I I don't get super deep in them. He gets super deep in them. We we know this. Kyle don't care. Kyle gets super deep. Nothing wrong with that. That's how Kyle grows, and that's what keeps him in the Bible. God bless him for it, right? What keeps us in the Bible? That's what you got to find out. You got to know your 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 strengths and your weaknesses, right? That's how you stay growing in the Bible. I personally like finding r- relatable items in the Bible that I can relate to people because I'm I'm more, kind of an introvert. You know, I'm not really good in crowds and stuff like that. But you give me one on one, I'm okay. Can hold my own, I guess. But I mean, what is a Christian, though, ultimately? It's just it's a theological question, right? From my own standpoint, a Christian is somebody not only worships and loves Jesus. We all know these things. It's superficial stuff, right? But somebody who can stand bedside when somebody is having the worst day of their life or traumatic day of their life, and you can stand firm as a rock for that person, and they know it. Maybe you only have to be best friends, but they know you call them up. I haven't talked to my Aunt Donna in eight years now. Eight years. Her brother dies, and she calls me out of the blue. Hey, Ryan, can you do the service? Oh, I get, yeah, I guess. Why? Well, I guess there's no other men in her life. And she goes to a church. She goes to a church in Harrisonville. Mm, I have no idea. Any thoughts, though? What is a, what is a Christian in y'all's eyes? Oh yeah, I get it. <laughs> Definitely, I get it. Yeah, I remember we said that. Mm-hmm. You got to make it fun, or if not, it'll, it'll be real sad. For like 10, for well, probably not 10 years, maybe six years, my stepdad uh, bought me a case of beer every time we had a family get-together just to see if I'd drink it, you know what I mean? Because he knows, number one, that was my weakness. I had to find out what, everybody's got to find out what what separates you from God. What is the one thing that separates, that's what sin is, a separation from God. What is your one thing that keeps you separate from God? Mine was partying and drinking. I slowed down when the kids were around, but when I got back with my buddies, you know, every you know, month or weekend, it was a bender, you know, it was bad, it was stupid, right? I had, I have to stay away from that stuff. I have to. I know it. It's just something that I can't do. There's certain guys I can't talk to. I can't talk to them for very long, that's for sure. If they do call me up, hey, man, hey, text me next time, you know. It's just certain things. But, but, uh, but yeah, that's what, that's what these, uh, these studies are for, these uh, relatable I, I, objects and items in the Bible that kind of bring you back like what does your Christian faith mean to you how how does it make you strong in your life not just with your I mean maybe it's with your kids or maybe it's with uh, your family maybe there's somebody you need to work on to get saved but 
that's what it is to be a Christian, I think, not just being all knowledgeable. I mean, there's so many people out here who know the Bible, but they don't want to teach it. You know, that's a Bible. Yeah. Yeah, no situations, that's for sure. You dare to be a light, right? You 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 got to be the light bulb in the room at some point cuz I mean, there a lot of people's brains go straight to darkness. They just can't help it. You know, Christians too, they just can't help it. They think they think the automatically worse things are like, "Hey, yeah, Israel got bombed and tribulation could be around the corner, but hey, that's a good thing." Isn't it? Like <laughs> that's okay. Don't worry about it so much. I mean, we spend all this time on the Antichrist and all these things, and we're not even going to see the guy. We, we'll see the false prophet. We ain't going to know who the Antichrist is. Not for sure. We'll have our guesses. We ain't going to know. We won't be here. This ain't going to happen. Whoever we think it is, we'll probably see the false prophet and the Antichrist and be like, okay, yeah, that's good. But at that, we won't know. It could be anybody. I mean, my dad still thinks it's Barack Obama. My dad still thinks Michelle Obama's a man. 100%. I am not kidding. He believes you that woman's a man. Exactly. There's all kinds of conspiracy theories out there, and that's one of them. Boy, that's one he lashed onto. I'm like, Dad, no kidding. Yeah, conspiracy facts. <laughs> that too. You know, you don't want to you don't want to cause yourself to be a stumbling block for a young Christian if you come in there with some things that are just your opinions. Honestly, there a lot of things we're in opinions, and we put them down as by Bible fact, eh, I think Kyle does a good job of discerning both when he's up here preaching or doing Thursday nights, like, you know, the astrology stuff. He was quick to say, look, look, some of the stuff is just what I piece together, and it's not dogmatic, it's not pure doctrine, but it's cool, and that's what keeps him in the Bibles. He's sharing his, what he what he likes, he's sharing with us. Not Okay, I like it, it's fine. I got no problem with it. I like it. But I think he's quick to say, like, this is, I can't prove it. You know, I can't tell you that. The truth, the rapture is going to happen in two months. If he did, we'd all have to call him out on it, as good Christians do. Because you can't. You can get close, I'm sure, but you can't. You can't time it. It's not going to happen. Well, if y'all ain't going to talk, I guess we'll close it down. What do you got, young man? Nothing. He's like, oh, don't pick on me. Picking on you because he's the only young guy. All right, Jonathan. Oh, you can't pray. Pray is out. He can't talk. Yeah, go ahead and pray. Yeah. Amen.